landscape as big as this demands a different way of thinking. At least, that's the way Whistler Blackcomb sees things. It's no ordinary place, and it inspires a level of innovation, of interaction, of performance that's beyond the ordinary. This is what it's like to play on a different level altogether. Because on a scale this big, you can't help but see things differently. This is the story of the lengths that Whistler Blackcomb went to make an epic mountain experience even better. In the mountains, we get a glimpse of Mother Nature in all her glory. Her changing moods demand that we bring our best game. All our ingenuity comes into play in response to the demands of the environment. It's always been this way. The Squamish and Lilwa people flourished in this landscape through an inventiveness and a willingness to adapt their tools and technologies over time, as if they were having a long conversation with nature. In time, others join the dialogue. Loggers, trappers, gold seekers, pioneers, big dreamers, and big mountain people, all rising up, turning their ingenuity to whatever challenges the landscape threw down. Even the simple task of getting from point A to point B in this land of rivers and glaciers required a certain creative daring. It's simple call and response. Hugh Smythe has been part of that evolving conversation. As a young ski patroller in 1966, and as president of Intrawest Mountain Resorts. Hugh always had a different way of looking at things. Whistler Mountain started in uh, uh, February of 1966, and the whole mountain, the gondola, the red chair, and the two T-bars was built for approximately $750,000 back, way back then, 42 years ago. We had a fellow parking cars on a horse, his name was Tex, and it was quite a challenge for him to get the cars parked with people all racing for the ticket office to get uh, their one dollar discount off of probably what was a six dollar lift ticket in those days. Since the start in 1966 the technology has changed significantly. The first gondola that we had you uh, pushed the cars around and pushed them out and uh, everything was done by hand. Um, there was no grooming, no, no grooming machines, uh, so it was all uh, kind of off-piece skiing so to speak. Whistler's story has been about breaking the mold from the outset. When you look back at Whistler's past, this place has really been about uh, innovation and breaking new ground. I mean, this whole place started with an Olympic dream more than 40 years ago, and if you look at back at what's happened since then, I mean, the village, uh, the terrain parks, the festivals, events, hot dogging, the amount of energy and creation in this place is amazing. And one of my favorite innovators over those years was Jim McConkey. He was one of the first famous free skiers. He, you know, showed us but you could actually go out and go heli skiing. Taking a joy ride, a mystical journey far from town on our way. Just passing time as we drop down. And we used to charge $50 for three runs. <laughs> it was considered expensive, but uh, people really enjoyed it. They loved to do it. Fabulous terrain. Maybe we'll find it over the crest of this tall hill. I really enjoyed it, and I thought it was good to promote Whistler, to get it going so people would see the vastness of the skiing around here. Jim McConkey knew that the ultimate ski experience was in the high alpine. 
Whistler Blackhome began to open up this terrain, expanding access over the years into high alpine bowls and chutes. They knew that once you get high, you want to stay up high. You want the alpine experience to last. So the next step was to make it easier to stay up there above it all. Bridging the gap between the two mountains, bridging the alpine experience from winter into summer was the next evolution. The visionaries of Whistler Blackcomb have dreamed for years connecting Whistler Mountain and Blackcomb Mountain. By coming up with the CS system, we have now this technology to realize the dream, the dream of connecting Whistler and Blackcomb Mountain. The peak-to-peak -peak gondola was the next step in the progression. Putting this lift together and building it was a very big deal. It was a huge decision to get to the point of saying, yes, let's go do it. The project was moved through the, through the hierarchy of our company by Dave Brownlee. He did a great job of making sure we got the finance and got the support that we needed. The technology, the cost, and the business rationale were all huge challenges. But we knew that if we really wanted to take our mountain experience to the next level, we really had to do something much bigger. And that was to link the two mountains from the top. When Doppelmayr developed the 3S technology, which then made it feasible to link the two mountains, we knew it just had to be done. We spent three years crunching numbers, working through the logistics, and selling the dream to our shareholders. Finally, on April 17, 2007, with the Olympics just around the corner, we announced to the world that it was going to happen. By joining the two alpine areas of Whistler and Blackcomb Mountain, this gondola will double the access to the high alpine terrain and truly revolutionize the guest experience in summer and in winter. Just because it had never been done before was no reason to hesitate. After all, most things that have made Whistler great had never been done before. The hard work in the mountains is done by the ones who go first, by those who break trail, scope the line, make the impossible real. It's Whistler. It's, it's new ideas, and not just new ideas, but snowboarding. When other resorts were, ah, should we let snowboarding happen? Whistler was embracing snowboarding. It's coming up with things like the first ever snowboard cross. Started on Blackcomb back in the 80s, and now it's an Olympic sport. I think of innovators like Mike Douglas, a Whistler local and a, and a true pioneer in the twin tip ski. He showed the ski world a new direction. I mean, I think about mountain biking. We had the trails, we had the lifts, we had this population of nut bars living here with mountain bikes. So they put them all together and created the best mountain bike park in the world. And bike park builders all around the world are dropping into Whistler to see what are we going to do next. And thinking of Whistler guys, the legends of, of Eric Piotta and, and Trevor Peterson, who were taking first ascents to a whole new level. They opened a door for skiers and riders to a newfound freedom to realize, you know what, anything is possible. Yeah, when I first came to Whistler, it was about 1984. The first thing I did was look up at amazement at the Alpine and just went unbelievable. And, you know, I had to go there. So uh, that winter, I basically spent all the winter uh, hiking and ski touring around and skiing up in the Alpine above the existing lifts at the time. And uh, not too far in the near future, they started to put lifts in. And, you know, I think they realized that that's where the people wanted to be and ski was that beautiful high Alpine. I think a lot of areas in North America didn't really have that to offer, and Whistler does. When what was previously inconceivable is now not only conceived, but executed, it resets the bar indefinitely. Back in the day when we, when we first started skiing Spankies and whatnot, it, it was pretty much a, a full day epic. Today, you can ride a lift basically to the top, ski down and be back in the lift and do the full circle in less than an hour. That's the ongoing story of Whistler, a place where visionaries, athletes, imagineers step up to the challenge of this terrain and move the progression a notch ahead. Well, the mountains here at Whistler are, are a great drawing card for creative people and forward-thinking people. 
And uh, once you kind of get that critical mass, it's like the place is unstoppable. There's so much energy here, and to be a part of that is, is really, uh, really something special. A few years back, I produced runway films. Whistler was definitely really supportive of it, and they built us our own huge jump on the top of the mountain. And uh, we had a helicopter follow us off the jump, and it was so awesome because we had top snowboarders just destroying it. And it was one of those moments where I was just like, is this really happening? It was a dream come true. It was just awesome to be able to see the uh, progression in our sport at that moment. Stand up, you can be As soon as something becomes normal feeling, I'm always looking for the next challenge. And uh, right now I'm producing a web show called Solomon Free Ski TV and we're just telling ski stories and it's, uh, it's a creative outlet for me and it's super fun. And when it comes to getting footage, one of the things I like to do the most is shoot with my HD helmet cam. And technology lets us kind of create these really cool angles and perspectives of skiing that, that haven't been done really well before. Sometimes uh, when I'm watching that helmet cam footage, it feels like I'm doing it again, and that's the best feeling ever. It's never been done before. <laughs> Let's do it. It's more than concrete and steel that makes Whistler Blackcomb's peak-to-peak -peak gondola so progressive. For me personally, this is a very exciting project, putting up uh, the longest and largest lift in, in North America. I've been doing construction 30 years, roughly, and I've done a lot of large projects, but never, ever did I ever think I would be doing something like this. This is bigger than any of us. This was an incredibly large project and uh, one that, you know, it took everything we had to get it done. We're faced with some uh, pretty unique challenges uh, up on the mountain here. Uh, as you can see today, we, we've got uh, snow on the ground and yesterday morning when we came up here, we had about uh, 20 to 25 centimeters uh, of fresh snow. Building this anywhere would be huge. Building this at the top of the mountain while it's open for skiing We've got a ski operation going on at the same time as we're trying to do the construction of the of the lift here and as well as moving lift terminals and that's creating some unique challenges for us and uh, we, we work uh, with those challenges every day. Two existing chairlifts on Blackholm had to be relocated to make room. The solar coaster actually was moved downhill uh, like, a, like you move a house on a big dollies and we put a new pad in and just rolled it down the hill about 40 or 50 meters and that was it. Boy, this is a huge milestone in, in this project getting this out of the way, I'll tell you. Over 3,000 cubic meters of concrete for lift platforms, mass and columns had to be trucked up the mountains on access roads that had never seen that level of industrial use. 400 tons of steel was needed to build lift towers. We're at uh, Tower 3 on the Blackcomb side right now. Uh, it's one of uh, two of the taller towers, uh, each of them being 65 meters tall when they're complete. And right now, the guys are uh, getting ready to set the next uh, level of steel on top here, and, uh, and that starts heading for the tower head, which supports all the tower machinery and the support mechanisms for the ropes. The crew that's here, they're over from uh, Delfmar Garaventa. Uh, they're a group of Swiss guys. They're the crack shot guys that are directing this stuff. Working at heights over 200 feet off the ground, in all kinds of weather, requires a certain comfort with exposure. Building your lifts on these mountains has always been a bit of a challenge. 
Back in the 60s when the Creekside Gondola was built, it was state-of-the-art technology and the hurdles that everybody had to overcome just to build that lift at the time. They transported equipment up with pack horse, they flew concrete in beer kegs underneath the helicopters. And now we are, we're looking at the peak-to-peak -peak technology and it's amazing what we can accomplish. Twenty-seven kilometers of steel cable was built in Switzerland at the only factory in the world capable of such a feat. The cables were shipped through the Panama Canal and unloaded in Vancouver, Washington, as there were no docks in Western Canada that could handle the 500-ton load. The 11,000-mile journey continued by rail, bringing the five spools weighing 90 tons each to Whistler. To meet the challenge of transporting these massive spools up the hill, specially designed trucks and trailers had to be brought in from Quebec. Whenever somebody says uh, a job is impossible, that's when they call me to do it. Well, this specialized trailer has 12 independent axles. Each of the axles steers independently, so they're able to turn the wheels on the trailer to aid going around the corner, so they were able to drive up the switchbacks without too much problem. 90 tons on, on the back of a truck was quite the challenge. We had a 40-ton rock truck in front of the trailer uh, and truck. We had a 30-ton rock truck pushing from behind and we had to slide a, a large loader in, in as well to help us along the way. And it was challenging to get the ropes to the top of the hill. They are all safely at the top of the hill, set in place, and the uh, Doppelmayr Garavanta crews are, are starting to pull them across the valley. It took 11 weeks to pull the 27 kilometers of cable across the valley, more than 400 meters above the Fitzsimmons Creek. The 3S technology made it possible to span the 4.4 kilometer distance between Whistler and Blackholm with only four towers. Since the cabins ride on two track ropes, there is greater stability on windy days and reduced power consumption. In September 2008, the cabins were ready for their first historic crossing. I know um, Matthias uh, Zudrell, he jumped up on the carriage and rode, a, rode across and I was very envious as I saw him coming in at Tower 1 on the Whistler side. I still envy him of that first ride across on the carriage. It was a beautiful sunny day and uh, quite an event for all of us. The awesome scope of the landscape and the mountains threw plenty of challenges in the project. But it also made people transcend themselves and accomplish something that will forever be a career highlight. Myself and everyone who's worked on it will be very, very proud and now we get to turn it over to the public and let them be as proud as we are. This is pretty overwhelming. There's a million people in here waiting to get in the gondola. Everyone's excited. It's a great day. I can't believe it's actually here. We made it. Made it on time, on budget, and here we are today going across on schedule. Oh, the whole team did such a great job and now we can see what we have done. I've been in the ski business my whole life and uh, today is one of those moments that uh, I'll have in my heart for the rest of my life. It was really exciting when to get into feet. Peak Gondola for the first time, I mean, it's like really impressive, really beautiful because you're getting so high on top of the mountains and you can also pick out some really cool powder runs that didn't used to be there. I mean, my friends used to fight so much on a good powder if you were going to ride Whistler or ride Blackcomb. So now you can ride both mountains in one day. It gives me all the terrain, it's all available to me now. I mean, if, if, the, if there's clouds over here, I can be over there in 11 minutes, just like that. And that's the classic Whistler move. You come up in Whistler, get the morning sun, and as it breaks on Blackcomb, you just slide on the peak to peak, and then you're basking in the sun over in 7th Heaven. 
The Peak to Peak story is about challenge and the thrill of rising to meet it. But the challenge thrown down by a landscape that is so inherently demanding of our ingenuity is also a demand for our humility and our stewardship. Because it is not just our playground and our testing ground, it is our habitat. Environmental issues were a big part of our decision making along the way. As big as the lift is, it has a very small footprint. Two terminals, four towers, only two of the towers had to have new development in areas that weren't already developed. The access to one of those towers, we had a choice of going through a bear habitat or going a little further around. We took the choice of not disturbing the bear habitat and avoiding that. And the electrical consumption to run the lift actually is quite light, so less than a normal you know, high-speed quad. The gondola, like all technology, is a tool, a vehicle that opens up possibilities. For hardcore riders from opposite sides of the valley to meet for a run together, and for skiers of all abilities to stay above the clouds and experience the high alpine on both mountains in one day. But it also elevates Whistler Blackcomb to a year-round experience, doubling the number of summer hiking trails and opening up endless possibilities to all. She enjoyed the ride because she can see where we ski and she can tell her friends she was on the same gondola and on the same mountain, even though she doesn't ski. The Peak to Peak Gondola is the latest chapter from a place rich in stories of technological innovation and daring. But it wasn't about breaking records, although records were made. It's just so smooth and to travel from here over there in 11 minutes in comfort and out of the weather and the scenery and it blows my mind. It wasn't just about having another reason to celebrate. Although it was a pretty good party, it wasn't about being a daredevil, although it attracted them too. It's really about sharing the mountain experience. I think really on Whistler and Blackcomb being the two biggest mountains in North America, you have to enjoy the best of both worlds. And with that lift, just the accessibility is unreal. The best of both worlds are at your, literally, ski tips. With the peak to peak gondola, we went first and open the door to infinite possibilities. It's not just about an 11 minute gondola ride. It's a chance to stand on the shoulders of giants. Get back up and try hard as a 